Welcome back, everyone. I've got my München Deutschland shirt on today because this morning I leave for Germany. Of course, I'll already be there and probably be in Austria by the time you see this video. Uh, but I uh, wanted to record a bunch of stuff ahead of time so that there will be plenty of content while I'm gone. You will be seeing a lot of content from my trip for sure. Uh, and this isn't just my trip. This is a trip for 21 of us. There are 20 viewers of the channel who are along for the journey, and I'm so excited to finally meet everybody in person. We've been talking a lot the last couple of months. It's going to be a fun time. I want to give a shout out to Hunter in Young Harris, Georgia, and Joshua in Longmont, Colorado. Hey, I've been there before, Longmont, Colorado. Thank you guys so much for your support on Patreon. Today, we're looking at Jack Rackham again, and in my analytics, it tells me a lot of you have been watching this video uh, that came out two weeks ago called After Occupation, Why Didn't Germany Hold a Grudge? I think it's an interesting topic to take a look at. The aftermath of World War II, everybody talks about the war itself, but so much of the modern world was shaped by the events in those years following the war, including the occupation and the aftermath. So link is in the description if you want to check out the original content without my commentary. I highly encourage you to check out his channel. He does a fantastic job telling stories with humor, but also a lot of information. So let's go ahead and dive into this one. You in the shoes of the Allies in 1945. Congratulations, you've just won the biggest war in history. Quick question, what are you gonna do with Germany? Because uh, World War III would not be fun, and your constituents all agree that a world without Nazis would be best for everyone. Yeah, so even before World War II is over, right, the allies are already thinking about what do we do you know there's there's a point at which you get to the place where it seems clear that if everything continues the way it's going you're going to win the war so your mind at least in part goes to what happens next this happened in the american civil war where as early as 1863 there was already the beginning stages of a plan for what they were already calling reconstruction what well, what are we going to do once we win this thing uh, and the same thing's happening here. The, the overwhelming manpower and resources and the direction that the fighting is going makes it clear that at some point the war will be won. What that looks like, who knows? So, for example, we all like to look at Normandy and the invasion of Normandy, and, and many people argue that's the turning point of the war. Well, it really isn't from the standpoint that with or without the invasion of Normandy, Germany is going to lose the war at that point. What Normandy does is it's, it inc increases the likelihood that the Western allies, the British, the French, the Americans, and others are going to have more of a say on the continent after the war, right? The alternative is the Soviet Union marches from the east, they conquer everything, and all of Europe comes under their dominance after the war. The Western allies don't want that to happen. But you also have to look at the fact that, okay, we've now fought two world wars, where Germany is one of the main antagonists. We can't leave Germany in a position to do that a third time. Who could try suppressing the country so far down they can never rise up to be a serious threat again, but, well, you tried that at the end of World War I, and look how far that got you. And besides, you'd better make sure that the new government has everything it needs to be stable and right. won't be supplanted by other regional or rebel factions like Afghanistan or Iraq. What if yeah, because I uh, understand that that was kind of what happened in World War One, right? After World War One, there's a power vacuum. You no longer have the German Empire. You no longer have a Kaiser. And there's a lot of questions about it. Is it going to be socialist? Is it going to be communist? Is it going to be democratic? Uh, and that was kind of up in the air for a while with a lot of these countries. What if you split up Germany into a bunch of smaller countries? That way they can all industrialize and develop and get rich however they please, but none of them will be too powerful to threaten the whole world again. Not a bad idea, but... Well, that's sort of what Napoleon did in 1806, and it wasn't too long before somebody started putting all the pieces back together. And they did it by creating the most heavily militarized population in the entire world. I mean, if you really want to say in how things are run in Germany, you could try annexing it, but on top of conquest being a big yikes, 
who's gonna get it? That's gonna be a big upset to the balance of power, not to mention incredibly expensive. You just spent all your money fighting the biggest war in- Hey now, are we really including Austria as part of Germany at this point? We ought to be letting them have their country back. They were annexed by Germany in 1938. History, your third world colonies are getting uppity already, so good luck with that. You definitely can't just leave Germany alone, because what's gonna happen if you give the vote back to the Nazis? You're just gonna get Hitler 2.0, right? I, you know, but honestly, at that point, would the Germans have voted the Nazis back into the pow into power? I have a really hard time thinking that was true. Um, looks like he's gonna have a little My Heritage ad. Working on a sponsorship. This video with them is sponsored right by now. My Heritage, the world's greatest we'll family history service. I love learning my family history. It makes me feel like an explorer, putting the pieces of a long-lost map back together. I used it to discover I'm a seventh cousin of the Bush family. That's because signing up for MyHeritage gives you access to over 19 billion records to help you discover your origins. And I'm gonna do some more family history content in the near future, because that is a passion of and mine. And with their instant discoveries feature, like you see here, MyHeritage will automatically match your relatives with records on other people's trees and can fill out parts of your family tree for you. You might end up discovering relatives you didn't even know you had, especially if you're a person of German ancestry living in Argentina. Instant discoveries will also pull up photographs of your relatives, and MyHeritage can bring them to life in full color. Listen, that MyHeritage app where it can colorize and animate the pictures is fantastic it's a lot of fun even animate them if you use the qr code on screen or the link in the description you can get access to everything my heritage has to offer with your 14 day free trial and if you decide to keep your subscription you'll get a whole 50 percent off happy exploring Hello and welcome to the first part in a series I like to call The second half of the 1940s is actually really important, but we always brush over it in favor of World War II. World War II is yep. why things changed, but how the world changed for the next 50 plus years is the story of 1945 to 1950. 100% true. We... And I'm guilty of this too. We focus heavily on the history of warfare. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, very roman romanticized stories that come out of those periods. There's a lot of upheaval. I think, especially for guys who are into history, we tend to really gravitate toward military history. But man, so much of our world and so much of the, the history of warfare is determined by what happens in peacetime. So I want to take a look at the four biggest players in the European theater and take a look at their place in the New World Order. Starting with the most undisputed- Oh man, is he skipping France? Oh, the French people aren't going to be happy with this one. ...baddies of history, the Nazis. Take a bet, how many times do you think I can say that word before this video gets demonetized? As you may know, after the First so World true. War, France led an effort to punish Germany really badly. And this led to Germany being a really sore loser, blaming the Jews and invading their neighbors. That's why- That oversimplifies it, but that's kind of what happened. And, and a lot of people will point to the fact that, well, hey, France got pretty badly treated in the aftermath of their loss to the uh, Germans in the Franco-Prussian War, which led to the Frank the German uh, Empire in the first place. Uh, and that's a fair point to make, but we can't escape the fact that uh, the reparations, the Treaty of Versailles definitely played a factor in creating the conditions in Germany that allowed... Uh, those guys to come to power in the first place. Why, in 1939, as soon as Britain declared war on Germany, the Allies were already working together to come up with a plan for how to handle the country after the war so that history wouldn't repeat itself. The UK and the United States put out a really important document that's probably going to show up a lot in the rest of this series called the Atlantic Charter, and they made one thing very clear to Germany. This would not be a repeat of 1918. They wouldn't go too heavy with reparations, and they wouldn't be taking any territory. And listen, the United States, even in the aftermath of World War I, was probably one of the biggest voices against uh, crippling sanctions and reparations on Germany. Uh, for all of the many, many, many things I will criticize Woodrow Wilson for, he was kind of right on that one. Wait, America? Why are you saying you won't take my land? Do you want me to take your land? We're not even at war yet! 
Which is why I won't be gaining any territory. Oh, is that why you are signing off on statements about the final destruction of Nazi tyranny? No, that's because you're a head. Now, once the Soviet Union joined the war against Accurate. Germany, well, working in Stalin's vision of the future was a little awkward. The Allies' whole first major conference together was a little awkward. Even working with Stalin in the first place felt like teaming up against the forces of evil with friendship, harmony, incredible violence, and love. <laughs> Nice skirt you got there, De Gaulle. Um, it, it's a great point, though. I mean, listen, let's acknowledge the fact that Stalin was every bit as evil as the Nazi regime in Germany was. Uh, probably responsible for killing more of his own people than the Germans were. They just killed a lot of other people's people. But um, it's a whole, I say it all the time, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And the... The Soviet regime was a necessary evil to defeating Hitler. They could worry about what happened after that. After that. And then you'll open a second front in Western Europe, right? Well, we'd better cross our I's and dot our T's and knock out Italy first. You'll cross your eyes, and then you'll open a second front. Give us till summer of 44. At this rate, the war's end will have more dead Russians than living Englishmen. And what a happy day that will be. When the war is over, I mean. Now look, opening a second front is easy enough, but how do we close the door on a third war? Yeah, and this is a, another excellent point. Uh, Stalin was really, really pushing for the Western Allies to open another front. Uh, he needed some of the pressure to be taken off. I mean, they were doing what they could to help the Soviet Union with supplies, ammunition, finances, things like that. Um, but they needed to open a second front, and they recognized they needed to do it for the post-war world, too. This is easy part. We round up 50 to 100,000 German officers and shoot them in the head. Oh, dear. You'd think 49,000 would be too few. <laughs> I've had about enough of this. I was only joking. Come back. Stalin is not a man who solves his problems with purges. By the time 1945 rolled around, the trio had put together a plan. The country would be split into four zones, administered by the three major powers, and also France, as a sign of jolly cooperation. There had been some talks about dividing Germany on a more permanent basis. After all, Germany had only been united for less than a century, and had given everyone such a headache in that time. That's a fair point. Uh, you gotta... felt by a lot of people to keep Germany together because it was a fairly new nation. You can see there they're dividing the south. Basically what you got there is Bavaria, um, Austria, and maybe a little bit more there. Um, West German state, you're basically looking at uh, Alsace-Lorraine, uh, which had been fought over back and forth anyway, um, and maybe a little bit of the Sudetenland there. But ultimately they agreed the division would only Wait. last as long. I'm talking about the Rhineland. Sudetenland is the area around Czechoslovakia that they took right here. Uh, the Rhinelands in the west. As long as the occupation did. Once Berlin fell and the war was won, the challenge of winning the peace began in earnest. The occupation zones received their final borders, and the Soviet Union, who didn't really care about the Atlantic Charter, took off a chunk of the eastern border to be Poland's consolation prize. The first step was to completely uproot the German legal system. The economy was decentralized, cartels were broken up, and all the Nazi laws on the basis of race, creed, and political opinion were abolished. And there was a, one of the big uh, policies was denazification, and this is where a guy like George Patton runs into problem, because he's the military governor of Bavaria, which is the American zone, right? And, um, and he saw this differently. He felt that some of the uh, folks that just because they had been members of the Nazi party didn't mean they couldn't be used uh, to help kind of run things afterwards. So he kind of very quietly didn't necessarily enforce strict denazification, uh, and that got him into a lot of trouble. 
Then, of course, the justice and educational systems needed their own overhauls, and a new constitution would need to be drafted in order to make sure that the changes would stick. The top brass of the Nazi party were tracked down as much as possible to be made an example of. Twenty-four men were brought to face trial in Nuremberg for war crimes and crimes against humanity. At the same time, the US and its portion of the country began running campaigns showing the horrors of the Holocaust to German civilians. And this was brilliant because there were probably plenty of German civilians who were in denial about this. Now, if they had been honest with themselves, they could have probably seen enough of what had happened and what they'd probably seen with their own eyes to understand something was going on. Uh, but the full extent of it, maybe not. So this was an important part of this, was to let the, the German people see what their own country had done. Uh, Nuremberg also, these were some of the highest profile cases. They were hardly the only war crimes trials that were happening with Germans. Uh, and there were trials happening in places besides just by the Western Allies. The Soviets were trying a lot of people. Uh, the Poles were trying a lot of people. Eventually Israel, when it's established as a nation, nation, will try a lot of people. And you know, Germany today has a great track record of coming to terms with its past human That's rights true. violations. Unlike, well, quite a few other countries. So the occupation must have been a huge success. Except, the first couple years were pretty rough. The yeah, and let's acknowledge here too that... Um, I think sometimes I, I've, I've spoken to, we have a lot of German followers on this channel. Um, and I love you guys. I, I love Germany. Germany is one of my favorite countries in the world. Um, and uh, I think sometimes I've gotten a little bit of a hint of expressions of guilt by German people. And I just want to say this, and I think this needs to be said, is that while we can acknowledge the sins of the past, we are not responsible for the sins of our ancestors, okay? So uh, Germans today are not responsible for what Germans did in the 1930s and 40s. We can acknowledge that and make sure that we take steps to make sure it doesn't happen again. Same thing with the United States. The United States has plenty of sins in its past. Our treatment, obviously, of enslaved people from Africa, our treatment of Native Americans, indigenous peoples, as we call them today, um, in our manifest destiny and the way that we spread um, our treatment of Chinese immigrants over time and many other people, our treatment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, but I am not responsible for those things. My parents are not responsible for those things. We can acknowledge that it was wrong, make sure it never happens again. Initial policy of taking no steps to rehabilitate Germany led to intense food shortages, and it wasn't until a report from Herbert Hoover, of all people, and a change in leadership that things began to improve. Listen, Herbert Hoover, his presidency is not fondly remembered. Obviously, the Great Depression breaks out during his presidency, um, but he was a brilliant economic mind. Uh, he had been Secretary of Commerce uh, at one time, and that did not mean he didn't have something to offer the country and the world. And yet, when you look at all the surveys of public opinion that the U.S. ran, things didn't seem to be moving in the right direction. Right after the Nuremberg trials, about 6% of Germans said that they were unfair. By 1950, that number was about 33%. Wow. And 37% of Germans answered that the extermination of other races was necessary for the security of Germans. Although, in fairness, that one had been phrased weirdly. In 1945, 59% believed that Nazism wasn't a bad idea, and in 1947, that number had risen to 70%. 42% really? of Germans wanted a new Fuhrer. Meanwhile, the Allies are totally swamped trying to process the millions of Germans who were part of the Nazi party to determine who the true radicals are to keep them out of power. That's, I mean, when you're dealing with that, I didn't realize it was that high. That's crazy. Uh, and I will say this, too, that um, there was also another challenge in that in the aftermath of the war, there were hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Germans who fled the country, and many of them faced reprisals. Czechoslovakia is a great example of that. You had Germans living in Czechoslovakia, civilians, who were murdered in the thousands uh, in reprisals for what had been done to the Czech people, for example. 
Imagine having to run a background check on everyone in the country. And imagine trying to do that while pressure is mounting from back home. The war is over. Bring our soldiers back home. We can't take on any more debt. So, for the sake of efficiency, the process became increasingly lax as time went on. Laws about fraternizing with civilians were lifted, German citizens were trained to run the background checks on their neighbors, the whole process was subject to corruption. Mm. There were these certificates that said you might have been part of Nazi society, but in your heart of hearts, you weren't really a bad guy. And this number of people, it can't be heavily scrutinizing of every single person, right? There are certain key people you're going to keep your eyes on, influential people, things like that. In the aftermath of the American Civil War, they required people to take a loyalty oath to the United States. What's to keep somebody from just lying and saying, yeah, I'm loyal to the U.S., just to kind of get back into a position of power, just to turn around and do it again? And all of those certificates ended up getting bought and sold on the black market. At a certain point, with few exceptions, everyone under the age of 25 at the time of the war's end was just let free on the grounds that they had just been brainwashed and there was nothing you could do. As time went on, elections were rolled out, first at the local level, then the regional, and eventually the national level, when Germany had been reunited. West Germany, anyway. Stalin was doing Stalin things to the zone. Yeah, so the American, the British, and the French occupation zones all become West Germany. ...he'd occupied. A man named Konrad Adenauer was elected chancellor and called for an end to the denazification process. Of course, the U.S. recognized that the project was not going so well. It was counterproductive and ineffective, mm. so they were willing to let it go. But all the same, hey bro, stop picking on the Nazis so hard, is a little scary to hear coming from a German chancellor. And yet, plot twist number two, progress continued? The Adenauer government, which lasted 14 years, they were the ones who started giving out reparations of their own volition. And with time, the opinions on the Third Reich began to shift again. And that stability was super important, having the same government in power for 14 years in the aftermath of that war. Uh, hugely important for that to take place. After those first frightful years of occupation where food was scarce, a new currency tackled the problem of inflation, and investment from the United States kickstarted German exports. The economy started chugging along, and that kind of killed the itch for any radical new government. I have to. The economy, you know, we had a phrase back, I think, when Bill Clinton was running for president. It's the economy, stupid. Uh, stable economy and happy people and growth and peace go a long way to keep from having radicals rise up in your government. To imagine there weren't many people thinking to themselves, sure, my life is getting better, but, but I stubbed my toes this morning, and for that a minority must die! Perhaps the biggest difference between the end of World War I and World War II is just how overwhelming that defeat really was, mm. and how clear it was that the world was moving on. With the Cold War heating up and with Germany being split between East and West, it was clear that if World War III ever happened, Germans wouldn't just be on the front line, Germany would be the yeah, front line. hundred percent. East and West Germany- That was- very highly viewed. I mean, if you look at even at video games made in the 80s, uh, a lot of them, a lot of the ones that focus on a fictional war between the Warsaw Pact, which was the Soviet Union, their Eastern European allies, and NATO, centers on the front line being in Germany. Each had to pick a side in a polarized world, and in both cases, making new friends meant no more of that fascist tomfoolery. I'm still not sure what to make of this. Germany changed so dramatically over the course of the 20th century that I was kind of expecting some brilliant master plan, as though the world had cracked the code on how to turn even the most violent, hateful society into a stable, free, and peaceful democracy. I think a lot of the credit here has to go to the German people. Uh, they did a, a really good job of purging themselves of that evil and they've done a good job of staying on top of it in a pretty significant way better than a lot of other countries have that the only reason other occupations have failed is either incompetence or a price tag 
Make no mistake, there was a deliberate human element to Germany's recovery. New generations grew up with a chance to reflect on the horrors of the yep. Nazi regime. There are records of many small positive interactions between Germans and occupying soldiers that shaped opinions through word of mouth. Not only that, but if you look at, for example, the book Band of Brothers and some of the other books that came out from those guys, many of them said that of all of the countries that they were in, and they were in... Uh, England, they were in France, they were in the Netherlands, which they loved the Netherlands. Um, they were in Belgium, and many of them were in Luxembourg. They found themselves identifying more and respecting the Germans more than most. Uh, so I, I think, you know, and we even get to see that right at the end of the war, right? I'm reading the book right now, The Last Battle, about the Battle of Castle Itter, where you actually have Germans and Americans fighting on the same side against the SS. Uh, there were a lot of things that people had in common with the, the average German, despite the evil that had been perpetrated in Europe. Acts of kindness, of friendship, of love. But it would seem that what really did the trick wasn't the monumental effort to reshape society, it was the real politic of a changing world. Hmm. I find that a bit... There's, it's the economy, stupid. It's right there. Like, after all, if society can improve in spite of the counterproductive efforts of those with the most power to shape it, what are we supposed to do when the pendulum swings the other way? Hmm. Join us next time, because the world Germany emerged into in 1950 was a very different place than just five years before. All right, interesting. So this is going to be part of a series. So we'll come back to it after I get back from Germany. And uh, I'll be excited to, to learn more along with you. Hope you guys enjoyed that. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.